Welcome everybody to Poetry Near and Afar brought to you by the Oceanside Library. Uh, we are delighted to have uh, a, a guest from afar, Holly Hardy, who's joining us from Austin, Texas. And we have our own Long Islander, Emily Sue Sloan, is with us as well. Uh, we look forward to a great night of this uh, as we continue. Uh, we do these uh, twice a month through May uh, and then pick up with the summer gazebo readings outdoors every Monday night in June, July, and August. Um, and so we are delighted to uh, to start this right off. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Holly Hardy. Oh, thank you so much, Tony. I'm delighted to be here. I have been um, on tour all summer with my um, brand new book, Lions Like Us, which came out in June on Red Light Lit Press. Um, but I didn't get to New York, so I'm gonna just pretend y'all are all New Yorkers, and uh, this is this is for you. Um, I'm going to read some poems from Lions Like Us, and then I'm going to read a couple poems from my first book and one brand new one. And um, it, my open mic reading series, Saturday Night Special, um, since we're online and you can't make a lot of noise, if you want to express your appreciation by putting your favorite lines in the chat as you hear, um, that would make me super happy. All right. Elevator pitch. Take me home to ripen and model in the dim light of candles, to open small mouths and lick like flames at the edges of you. From the window of your glass elevator, you flicker like a moth. The city pours its artificial stars across the silent nightscape. I want to say, pack your suitcase, gather your ghosts, Let's live in the ocean like salt. Let's build a treehouse of wind and sand. Still we wear our chains, rusting like fear, counting our seat belts, counting the rain. I open my mouth to tell you how hunger binds us together, how the tether of night unties the moon. I open my mouth, but a wren flies out. I wanted to say, take me home. Storm. The nightscape is a skillet of coffee shops, bone split patterns of jagged light, a swarm of incorrect sky. Nor can the go that green gives be ignored. These flesh vessels, their slippery delights, your willful promiscuity. We are wet hair, soul drenched, infused with liquor. We are the sound of rain on roof. Here is a uterus I just know you're going to love. Unyielding, purpling, the unraveling of the throat. In a storm that doubles as longing, how we shudder and thrust and ache. Gnaw at the angel's bloody hammer, strain against the rope. Until at last we curl and sleep in this garden of little letdowns, private animals, guardians of tenderness. All right, this one is for New York, another Manhattan. Something dark and new growls inside the night circus where my heart flutters like a spectacle in its little cage. The lion, the whip, and the taste of you lingers like a season, nicotine and leather, those hands. I've been drinking about my feelings again here in the forest of us where everything is newly planted. Are we rocks or air? The tide of you rolls out. Light shines through the doorway like a message from home. Here is a lesson about truth, sculpted of bricks and glass. Here is another Manhattan. I'm trying to be taller again, and you are teaching me to wait. This cherry is not a metaphor for loss. The way blood prefers to be inside the body, but rushes away at every opening. A kind of defeat by escaping. I want to see the stars again. I want to walk with you in the rain. I wake up with my hands folded over my chest like a coffin. Sometimes you're here, nestled in the small of my back. And sometimes you're gone. <clears throat> I 
unseen. Perhaps you are the spark which lures the moth to its glowing demise, igniting the divine. Charred whispers travel the breath. Jasmine climbs the night air, teasing. Your balsamic laughter, a memory of violence. That which is invisible languishes in abstraction. The texture of smoke, your unconscious bias. I resolve to end a poem without resorting to sleep. I discover my mistakes like strange treasures reflected in the actions of others. The ocean's indifference, relentless, roaring in my smallest bones, the secret ingratitude of sunlight. I lay back in the grass and let the sky slip over me like a childhood. I remember how you wanted to be smaller, how you tried to fold yourself into a paper bird, tiny wings full of dark. If they wanted to, all the spiders of the world could band together to eat all the humans of the world. And when they were done, we would be gone and the spiders would still be hungry. So if you couldn't tell, this is a book of love poems. <laughs> this next poem is called Lighthouse and it is the poem that is on the cover of the book. The book was designed by its muse, the love in every love poem. And so this one's for him. Lighthouse. We draw the shape of loss on our bathroom mirrors in dry erase. I traded your body for the sound of your voice, like water, like coffee, bitter honey and oak, evening breeze susurrating tall grass, the cats purr a distant dream, whispering, come closer, whispering, come back. We build a lighthouse of our time together to contain the wet of sadness, to fuel the fire of hope. Any day now we will move in to change the world. You will be the lighthouse keeper and I will be every boat saved by your light. Or maybe I'm the rocky shore where boats crash in the sea tossed darkness and you will walk along my banks like a new moon. This one um, I wrote when he was in the hospital for a surgery and I was worried about him. But I was also thinking about an aerial ballet that I had recently seen um, and how sad it was. <laughs> this is types of blue. Sometimes I miss the pretend versions of each other we made up when we met. I think of blue. Light bends the sky a darker shade of lonely. I think of mountains, fog-colored, spangled with twilight. I admit it, I long to disperse like ink in water, staining everything wet. I want to stop missing you, like Maggie Nelson's sleeve of ash falling off a lit cigarette. We are memories of smoke. I decide to start leaving you notes. I write, darling, I'm thinking of blue. I want to write a poem that makes you cry, like a Joni Mitchell song, rips the tears right out of your heart or throat or wherever tears are made. At the Blue Ballet, the dance about belonging is actually a story of grief. Sad ballerinas consoled in blue light, night air, humid with strangers. I think of wolf fur, the true color of winter, Picasso's blue guitar, Joni's melancholy voice, breaking up the line with fresh blue sorrow. You don't notice the imaginary love notes I've been leaving you. I just want you, I write. I just want you to be okay. This one I wrote um, for a little anthology that happened during uh, quarantine and uh, in the pandemic. It's called Staying Home. I dreamt I was packing a bag with the names of all the things and all the people I had lost. The names were scrawled on scraps of paper scattered across the floor and the bag was already too heavy to carry. Awake in the hammer of storm, we cannot experience wetness, 
Only hot and cold, only pressure. I motion you closer. In our collective apocalypse, we can't help reaching for comfort. We can't stop touching our faces. Streets are quarantine empty, a new kind of winter, or maybe they're just lonely. I read a study that says sometimes people think they're lonely when really they're just cold. So we devise a blanket drive for the brokenhearted. While I wait, my eyes are getting old and so are my hands, my hair, my skin. Maybe my American dream doesn't have a house or kids. Maybe this bridge is enough. Maybe this bridge and you. Blackbirds burst across the silver skyline like musical notes golden melody of melted sunlight, city silent and silhouette. Skyscrapers still break the horizon. Soft haze mutes the low slung sun like a lampshade. I keep trying to capture this bridge like a butterfly migration, like gratitude. What we prioritize is what we manifest. I scrawl your name on a scrap of paper. I keep trying to keep you closer. I pack a bag, motion of wings and wishing. I keep trying to define what home means, place or person, with animal bones and ash, carapace or carcass, apotheosis of city, city heartbeat, city girl. So I'll just read two more from this book. This is my war poem, Reimagine Nation. Reimagination. I look up changed, unbroken by silence. You become my self portrait in red. A child climbs over the fence and into the war. She says, Go ahead and start listening. I'll bill you later. The way love and isolation is self love, a stone in each hand is not the same as a bird in flight. Why do we insist on killing birds in every idiom? You are the riot under the flood, crashing through my dreams like a tidal wave, cool blue and permanent, our own private ending. In my dream, the bird escapes the cage. Too late, only the spider survives, its pale heart beating like the memory of wings. A child is born into smoke, an aftermath we reimagined, but politics still won the war against the earth. And we all lost, and we all lost, and we are all the child, and we are all the children, killing birds. Okay, this is super sad anniversary poem. It's always super awkward to read it when uh, my partner's in the room. He's he's not here, but he could probably hear me in the other room now. Super sad anniversary poem. I want to write poems of celebration and sorrow because all these poems about longing are probably boring your cat. And so the city unpeels itself, throws its slick wrapper into the ocean, careless of heights, indifferent to danger. We only hike uphill these days, a tough love re-education for the breath. I learned that in Malay, people rise up to love instead of falling in like Americans. And so we give pet names to waterfalls, like crash and crush, like brio, because roar is too cliche for lions like us. I miss you in the mountains, where the sun licks the sky, and at night, under panoply of stars, alone in my little tent. At home, I miss you in the kitchen, under my dress, in my empty mailbox, and in the audience, especially today. All right, so I'm going to move on to read you a couple poems from my first book. It's called How to Take a Bullet and Other Survival Poems. All of the poems in this collection are how-to poems with titles ruthlessly appropriated from the Worst Case Scenario Survival Handbook. I'm not going to promise that you're going to learn practical things that the titles make it seem like you will. <laughs> this first one is called How to Survive Adrift at Sea. There are handprints all over your weekends, windows thrown wide to the night. The curve of loneliness renders strange fingers brushing your bare shoulder. You concoct an elixir of fire. Goldfish swim below the surface of sleep, 
unfurling the lantern sea until you can't stop dreaming the wet of it. You savor the sensation of drowning instead of writing. An impossible crush unfastens something that was neatly folded. Paper thin panties hit the floor, dissolve into mint ice cream, the fragrance of another Monday night. But desire is never permanent and something new inflates your lungs, vacating old beliefs. In the nick of time, in the nick of bone, in the bed of another lesson, in the unspoken, miles are traveled. And with these scissors, you can mend the holes. How to fend off a shark. Wet fists in your eyes, the thump of undrumming, a figure in your peripheral vision. Here is the rind of night, facing off on a rock of ice, nightgown whipping, ragged around your thighs. Because silence is an expression of fear. Unwave that flag, unsmoke that cigarette, unfuck that friend, these desperate little fistfuls of defiance. This jazz song does not belong to you. Warm, the sensation of sleep, threadbare, the quality of wishing. Because police are at the door again, this wrecking ball in your bedroom, this fresh fountain of silver in your hair. Blue, the function of smoke, rumpled, the flavor of resistance. There are things that vanish unexpectedly, the stone talisman you carried for luck, photographs burned in a fire, bewildered, the pillow of regret. Because our experiences overlap, bodies at rest, hoarding dreams like stolen rainwater. Okay, I'm just gonna read one more. Um, I'm not sure where we're at on time, but I'm gonna read you one new one. This I just found out is going to be published in a little Austin uh, journal called uh, The Sneaky Ottoman Review. It's, that's, a, that's a cool name and you have plenty of time. All right, uh, things to do while falling. <laughs> Imagine the soft rise and collapse of a belly, the little dream twitch of whiskers and feet. At night, your body's fragrance shifts slightly from floral to animal. I hear you calling my name under the window in my dream as you float past. I experience a loss of elegance or focus, aperture unveiling, an undertow, petals as verb. Let me explain again. It was still the dream. We tilted inward toward an aftermath lit from within, an afternoon square of sun, light prismed on the living room floor. This was how we understood two-ness, quantum physics, the multiplicity of. The poem as a place to rest ideas or build a nest of gathered treasure. She painted over the poem, like putting on a second dress. I wanted there to be a lemon and a moon in this poem, or an egg, something a child could hold. Does death have its own light, she might ask, falling faster now. Here, you can borrow some of mine. Thanks. Thanks so much. I'm going to put um, a couple links for y'all in the chat. Um, I would love for you to come to Saturday Night Special. I would love for you to check out Praxis Poetry Weekly Prompts for Poets. It's a subscription service that I launched this year. I also teach workshops and have monthly write-in uh, accountability classes. And um, feel free to connect with me. And I will also show you how you can um, buy books. So here's just a couple of links. And thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you very much. Let's give her a nice round of applause, everybody. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. We appreciate that very much. Great, great reading. Yeah. All right. There you go. Um, I, I, accountability uh, lessons. I, I can certainly use those. Uh, that, that, that's something, something I should put on, on my calendar. Okay. Uh, again, if you're not going to, I see some people have already said that they're not going to participate in the open mic. If you do not want to, please put it in there. If you if you, uh, otherwise I assume that you will. Thank you again, Holly. And now without any further ado, our good friend, Emily Sue. Well, thank you, Tony. Thanks everyone for being here. 
And Holly, that was a beautiful reading. Uh, you're a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, the poems I'm going to read tonight um, are from, some are from my two books, We Are Beach Glass and Disconnects and Other Broken Threads. And some have been published in other anthologies. Um, the subject matter touches on the season we're in, some personal reflections, the state of our nation, i.e. concerns I have about social justice issues, and a couple of fun ones. So I will start with the handoff. Fresh starts run alongside summer's easy breezes for the handoff as the first fallen leaves paint mottled designs on grassy canvas. Roses keep the sun celebration alive while corn husk scarecrows shoo black birds off browning fields. Fall fairs bring out crafts and crowds who shuffle along in a chattering stream, dogs and babies in tow. Baseball builds up to this season finale while golfers and beach bums cherish each warm day knowing it may be the last. Yellow school buses make their afternoon rounds, setting kids free to chase the dwindling light, summer still clinging to their skin. Thanks. And this is my, uh, I wrote this one a long time ago. Um, this is how I feel about the changing seasons. Resisting change. I can't seem to let go of seasons. Put on turtlenecks and long pants when late April rings up 75 degrees. I run the heat in my car. I'm loath to put away my multicolored silk scarf and purple suede gloves. I'm the same about weekends. Hang on to Sunday, though it spins me out into Monday before I'm ready. I can't seem to let go of seasons. Self-conscious about taking off and putting on extra layers of protection. I don't fully understand it. Spring and summer are my favorites. Sweet smells, brilliant colors, new time fills the air. I long for this change all winter. Then when spring stretches and yawns, I want to hibernate longer. So contrary to wish for the change, only to turn my back when it arrives. I can't seem to let go of seasons any better than of blue jeans or books. I believe as fervently that I'll fit into my old 30 waist Levi's as that I'll reread Dostoevsky and Ruthke any day now. Is it the past I keep hold of or the future I fear? Between those two poles, the present slips by on silent precious tulip petals. I can't seem to let go of seasons. When fall's chill settles in, I'll resist sweaters and sleeves like a child squiggling out of party shoes. I have the same grip on decades, dug my heels in at 29, again at 39. I'll no more hold back the tide at my next nine. I tense my body, tighten my grip on what? Unclenched hands reveal nothing. Thank you. This next one is for all the introverts out there. A party. Never one to light up a room. My style's more to slip in on a cool breeze, smile, wave, kiss familiar faces, then occupy my hands with a clutch of snacks and a beer. I skirt the edges, find a comfortable corner, or with luck, an empty chair. Voices rise and fall with the hours. My hesitant hand might lasso a word. Tap a shoulder lightly to see if it will yield. Offer my two cents. They nod as if they've heard. My eyes drift to the front door, standing ready to receive thoughts of flight. But a familiar song rises above the clatter, pulls me upward like a tow rope on a ski slope. I see my foot bouncing to the beat. Thanks. Okay, this next one was inspired by a few news articles. It's called Trashing the Moon. 
When the moon shines full, you can all but see the dusty footprints left in sand-crusted craters by the early explorers who bounced across its surface in an anti-gravity dance of wonder, holding fast to God and physics. The story of life on the moon will be revealed in the debris traveler's shed to lighten their load for propulsion home or onward to more distant destinations. The vacation rental note reads, welcome, enjoy your stay. Please treat this place as you would your own home. And so they do, trash the moon and Mars and all the places rockets will take them next. This next one is called Morning in Retirement. Maybe some of you can relate. The coffee pot clicks on the burner like a mother's impatient tapping. Things need tending, practical things, laundry and dishes, yard work, groceries. But I sit at the kitchen table sipping coffee flavored with the day's news, email and word games until I can no longer ignore the blank page waiting for words to nourish it. Words that gather and scatter time in the wind. This next one is a, a new poem. Uh, it was just accepted into the brand new Eastern Seabards volume. It's called Reality's Prism. I thought I understood human behavior well enough, having lived among people all my life, but I can't predict actions. I'm blindsided by reactions. I'm on guard, always listening for cracks in pond ice watching for deer to dart into the road. Same town, same classrooms, shared memories of landmarks, public parks, favorite hangout spots. Yet when we peer into reality's prism, the light splinters, colors clash. Bridges collapse into racing rivers that carve canyons deeper and wider, churning up min Minerals they'll deposit like seeds in delta silt, payment for passage into infinity. It's writers I rely on to show me the way. Thanks. This next one is called Out from the Shadows. Let's not go back to unmarked bars dimly lit worlds where couples slow dance to jukebox music, pool sharks stand inside the circle of a single lamp, hold the table against hopefuls who line up quarters, dibs on a turn to rack and break. At the bar, regulars sit and sip, exchange glances, a hug here, a wave there, flirt with bartenders scurrying past to keep glasses filled. New arrivals shed public skins, adjust to the darkness that enfolds the women-only tableau, breathe fully for the first time that day, that week, maybe ever, until flashing lights announce police outside the door. To arrest or protect, always the question. Thanks. This next one, um, the next two are really reaching even further back in time. This one's called Driving by the Old House. We were kids twirling, whirling until the shout freeze turned us into statues panting scattered across the front lawn, an expanse that time and distance have whittled away to reveal a small yard outside a modest house on the slope of a hilly street. We whirled and we twirled in dizzying circles, catching hold of a breeze in the depths of summer. Summer, when time stretched wide and days elbowed their way into evening. Evening, when fireflies signaled in the dusky light that our games would soon be called on account of darkness. Okay. Who, me? 
things sure ain't what they used to be. Does every aging generation say so? Memories thin as gauze until someone says, do you remember when you and my sister dumped soap into the fountain at the mall? It was on the front page of the newspaper, but they didn't know who did it. And you want to say, no, that wasn't me. But then you paint a memory, bubbles rising over the ledge onto the tile floor and you are running, running. Was it me? Did I do that? Some teenage idea of fun and funny. Good thing cameras weren't tucked into every corner in those days. My friend's sister says the statute of limitations has passed, so now she's asking if I remember, and she's applauding our youthful protest against consumerism, if that's what it was. Yes, that must have been it. Lots to protest back then, and now for that matter. Wait, was I a juvenile delinquent? We did break some rules, probably laws too. It was the 60s after all. This next poem uh, won a prize at the Babylon Village Arts Council contest last year. It's called Hollow-Eyed Hunger. The shopping list on the fridge gets longer as portions shrink and hollow-eyed hunger deepens. If tears and worry could be cashed in like chips at a casino, there'd be no waiting in line at the food bank. No asking over and over how all those hours at a job or two don't add up. And this one is the title poem of my first book, We Are Beach Glass. Damaged and dinky, I still love it, the singer said of the old guitar he just bought. Maybe he had a soft spot for things showing their age after his, oh, maybe seven decades of living. I don't know him well enough to suppose. But no one comes through unscathed. We are shards of beach glass, sharp edges worn smooth by the tides, sheen muted by sun and sand, fragments of the mosaic waiting to be noticed, caressed, tucked into a pocket for safekeeping. This next poem appeared in an anthology called Rumors, Secrets, and Lies, poems about pregnancy, abortion, and choice. No choice. She hides her tears in the shadow of a heavy downpour, the morning gloom a warning. Do not speak of what you intend to do. Caught inside a web spun from black robes in secret pacts, false promises, she listens for guidance from voices who'd always told her to dream her future alive. Rage rings louder than the sound of slamming doors and she is resolved. Cloaked in her dreams and theirs for her, she steps onto the shadow road, knowing time is short. This next one, I, I call it a jazz poem. Its title is Chaos. Soft swirling lines cross your brow, wild disordered regrets dance at the edge. The fiddler calls the tune. Players know when to enter, when to rest inside the grace notes. Timing is everything except when it's nothing. A minute feels so long waiting for a train, so short when you're late. Chasing parallel tracks that never meet except in stories, where you find hope sitting beside you, taking you somewhere you've never been. You know better but can't lead the way out of the tangle. The trees remain standing after a night's angst and anger tested their power to sway, until the wind blew itself out to the point of laughter. So much laughter can make you cry. Where did all those souls go? They were just here with no more idea of what's to come than I have. So what if I didn't watch the news? Turning inward won't change the trajectory. Bits and pieces are breaking loose from the hive, landing softly on the ground.
This next poem uh, won the blue ribbon at this year's Long Island Fair. Hello, Judy. Uh, the theme was Long Island Treasures. Morning Par Morgan Park, Glen Cove, New York. Like Stonehenge, an open air rock structure rises. Sketch of a room above the Long Island Sound. Legend calls it the tea house, the temple. Low walls, the perfect perch for viewing the tides and the wooded hillside always changing course and color. This beach where dad brought us for a cooling dip in the slice of summer afternoons between work and supper where I learned I had fear to overcome if I wanted to swim and sail and ride a flexible flyer down gravity's packed snow, where twilight gathered up the town by land and by sea for picnics lit up by sparklers on the 4th of July, when famed Grucci fireworks exploded in a frenzy of sound and light, ringing ears and racing hearts, the odor of gunpowder in the air where I still go to perch on granite walls, scan coastline and hillside, never and always changing. Thanks. Well, once in a while, a ray of hope does shine through in my world. <laughs> Here's a brand new poem and its title is Hope. A morning dove rested in the grass until my gaze from the window disturbed its meditation on sunlight. It flew off just I as I wondered if it was and hoped it wasn't dead, only to be followed by one, two, three, no, a dozen doves rising out of the perennial flower bed. I'd failed to notice them, their feathers blended in so well with mottled soil where they pecked and chatted peacefully about the day and the way time is turning the dark hours longer and cooler, cicada songs reaching for stars hidden within the blue moon's light and acorns already split open on the ground. I see with new eyes the place where I live, stories no longer replaying unexamined inside the parentheses of my mind. After a journey mapped by falling fences, Joy has startled the landscape alive. Deep greens, earthy scents, and the wing whistles of doves taking flight. Thank you. And I will finish with this one. Um, it's actually the last poem in my Disconnect book. It's called Ode to a Teapot. Without a teapot, the tea won't steep, and without tea, there'd be no sleep. Without sleep, there'd be no rest, and without rest, there'd be no jest. Without jest, there'd be no laughter, and without laughter, no hereafter. Without hereafter, no before, and without before, no metaphor. Oh. Without metaphor, there'd be no clarity, and without clarity, there'd be no charity. Without charity, there'd be no dawn. So don't forget to keep the kettle on. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for listening. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, what a great night. What a great, great night. All right. We can unmute ourselves and give both of our features here a wonderful round of applause. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Emily Sue. What a, what a great night. And a night that I certainly have needed. All right, so we're going to move into our um, our open mic. Uh, and again, I remind everybody one non-epic link poem. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Mark, and then Ann Cohen is on deck. And Joe, we'll, we'll circle back to you, but we'll let you guys switch uh, switch spots. But so we start with Mark, and then Ann, you're on deck. All right. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Features. Your coconut windows hid the light so well. Your testimony put me in a spell. You look so wasted that I could not tell. Must this drag on forever? 
I keep bringing this poetry notebook to bed as I lay down for the night. Under the foolish presumption, I have something meaningful to say. I do not. The ink pen bleeds anyway. This is just like the tools on the internet, I say to myself, as notebook is shut and left on nightstand beside lamp still awake. A sigh of disbelief, realizing I had just trolled myself in my own poem. Well, it is a Saturday night, and I haven't had a drink in years. Unlike the crooner in Espanol outside in the parking lot, sounding like Sylvester the cartoon cat after snorting helium. Then a car door slams. Ignition strikes. Engine goes snap, crackle, pop. And the unmistakable rhythm of good years flattening gravel and acorns as car pulls out is cheered by the young women congregated in the parking lot. Chica laughs and says something undecipherable. As images of fast and furious streetcar race crowds fill my mind, I do not yet realize our parking lot has mysteriously gone silent, as if this poem were the alcoholic blackout before being so rudely interrupted by that damn hangover headache. Evidently, the party's been over a long time for this old geezer. <clears throat> Click, lights off. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Okay, and you're up, and Robert Rubino, you're on deck. Okay, oh, what a wonderful evening. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Emily Sue. This is a very, very old one. Um, anyway, I'll commence with it. Flight patterns. What was once a sheltered nest is no longer as fledglings are very nearly pushed out and fly apart from each other. The distance grows greater each year out of wisdom or ignorance or fear until only the wind can touch them and bring them back if they will listen to its call. Then perhaps they may fly together or not at all. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. You got you got a fan behind you there. All right. And you got a fan in front of you too. So that works out nicely. Okay. Uh Robert, you're up and Edna, you're on deck. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Holly and Emily Sue. Ben Hurd, 1959. 11th birthday. Your parents take you into the big city to see Ben Hur. Hollywood's latest spectacle at Manhattan's most opulent Art Deco movie palace with its carpeted winding stairways the color of dried blood and its hardcover book-length color photos filled souvenir programs. And somehow even the tuxedoed ushers and the popcorn's corny aroma seem so upscale you might never want to return to your crummy queen's movie houses with their milk duds and bug juice and prison guard matrons patrolling the aisles. You loved Ben-Hur and its pan to pagan Roman pageantry, loved its melodrama dripping revenge themed plot with its Christian uplift through suffering subtext and the horrors of the galley slaves and the sea battle rescue. And of course, you were too young to sniff the subtle anti-Semitism. Impressionable age, 11. And wow, that chariot race made an impression. Such an impression, you're still impressed 65 years later. That cinematic, bloody, tense, loud, wordless, wide-angle, close-up, 
crunching, squealing, thundering, unsportsmanlike chariot race. With bare-legged, strong-armed, chiseled chin charioteers and the whips and the spiked wheels and those poor, sweaty, pounding, pivoting horses and the standing room only stadium's maniacal uproars of anticipation and shock, the sedentary pleasures of visceral, vicarious, violent competition. Hey, those Roman Romans didn't have NASCAR or demolition derbies or the NFL, but they had chariot races, and we have Hollywood's Ben Hur version. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Robert. Always a pleasure. Okay, Edna, you're up, and then Butters, you're up. Where's Butters? Uh, let me see if Butters is still here. No, nope, Butters is not still here, so Butters is not going to go. Uh, so, Edna, you're up, and Hiram, you're on deck. Okay. Cash ex machina. I stand by the ATM, modest dispenser of money at Albertson's supermarket on State Street and 17, miraculous vending machine that lets me withdraw funds rightfully earned from my safely secured account, filling me with a small sense of bingo as they roll out. With a touch of my debit card and a few screen commands, it spits out a stack of $20 bills right into my palm and puts a winning smile on my face with an air of surprise, almost as if I were just kissed for the very first time. Yet, I feel exposed to the men crowded next to me by the giant jackpot looming over us, Idaho Lottery. With irresistible urge, they feed the ever-hungry beast that preys on their souls, luring them with hopes of beating the odds. I look down at the trash bin, overflowing with scratched out losing cards and want to tell them, why bother? Why not throw your money right into the can? <laughs> so true. So true. Great one. Thank you. Thank you, Edna. All right, Hiram, you're up, and Joe Cohn, you're on deck. Thanks, Tony. Um, and thanks to Holly and Emily Sue for... Complimentary, very different, but complimentary voices, poetry, really enjoyable this evening. This poem uh, first appeared in Hedge Apple, and it's all about reckoning with someone's passing. It's titled In the Next Room Over. I'll bet you whatever you want that she won't make it through the night. And that's not being dreary, that's just being honest. So anything out loud she says, pay attention to, but especially do if you hear her coughing or if you smell doom in the hay or hear water gushing down drains because she's preparing. Trust me, long, long ago, when things were as simple as that finger in your ear, she was a goddess, like smoke is in autumn. She was as pure as poured milk or the fullest of apples. That was then. Now the situation is a gaspy fish and the need to avoid and look away is deeply with us. 
but oh, will you just look here at this little frame? There we were once, posed under a tree, lined up like sparrows. She was the robin. So I tell you this with my heart for my throat, the cool, damp word is the least and the most we can do for her now. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hiram. All right, great job. And let's see. So now we're going to go uh, to, uh, to Joe and then Sharon Lyons. There he is. You, 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 oh. you, there you go. We're good. Okay. Hey, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Amy, for some great words you've given us this evening. This is a poem attributed to Ching An. Frost white across the river, waters reaching toward the sky. All I'd hope for is lost in autumn's darkening. I cannot sleep. A man adrift, a thousand miles alone, among the reed flowers. But the moonlight fills the boat. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Good. Always good to see you. Uh, Sharon, you're up. And Valerie, you're on deck. You got to unmute. I said, thank you. Thank you, there we go. Thank you, Holly and Emily, everyone. The poems were lovely. So I have a lot of pictures, photos of my life. So I started writing about them. And so this one is called Still Moments. I have pictures of those of us standing near the Christmas tree. Toasting a wish for New Year. Sitting at the table, passing food around. Moments in time when they all were here and we gathered around. The heart trembles during the Christmas time of the year. Thinking of all those who sat and stood around the tree is no longer here. It's hard to bear that all that is left are photos and memories of the way we were. All those captured moments in time, I have boxes of mine that I sweep the dust from and visit those moments. My life at earlier times. A photo is taken with a blink of the eye, just like life passes, and before you know it, it's time to say goodbye. But stored in boxes, the photos remain, telling stories of times. All those who have, who have left are pictures of their existence, smiling at their past. A photo of you in a gathering with all those you love that is no longer alive is a perfect piece of art. These photos, moments in time, touch deep down in the surface of our hearts. All those captured moments in time, I have boxes of mine, periods of my life throughout time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, Valerie, you're up, and Susan Moti, Moti, you're, you're on deck. Okay. Hey, great um, readings, everybody. Holly and Emily, Sue. I'm reading uh, from Listen and Leap. Calling in sick. There is such a tomb-like purpose there, 
coming up from the subway beneath tons of city and the office's artificial air and well-dressed asses. I've watched my noise-heavy heart reflected in smoky windows that don't open, wrestle with paperwork tangled in phone lines near to bursting while a slick tongue slithers through my ribs trumpets blare at my back hurry hurry i can't come in today not into the soil of the first cities ur jericho babylon the city a series of jars filled with coins heirlooms charms recipes anthems that have been buried dug up and emptied over and over again. Somewhere there are miracles hanging as the dying leaves of a silver maple drip red screams. The earth tumbles away from the sun. I won't be in today. I'm listening to the furious separation and the miracles happening there. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, Val. Thank you so much. All right. So, Susan, you're up, and JR, you're on deck. I, te I messaged you, but I don't think Susan's going to read. That's my mom. I don't even think oh. she knows that you think that she's going to read. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she's probably just listening. <laughs> well, thank you, Susan, for coming out, and thanks for supporting Holly and the rest of us uh, tonight. Thank you very much for coming out. All right, so JR, you're up. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Susan audience. Thank you, other audience. Thank you, Open. Thank you, Features. Terrific. And thank you, Tony. As always, you're keeping us in poetry. Um, so it's 82 degrees today. I'm holding on to summer with both hands. And I'll keep doing it, even though it'll be 24 degrees colder on Sunday. Out of breath. Oh. Okay. So this is from uh, Imagistics. This is Ode to Autumn, and it's told in the voice of summer. Follow me. It can be no other way, hands held, clasped in autumnal equinox. I bow to you. Pass the scepter of seasons, fall at your knees to rise again in June, rested, ready to bloom, ready to wake the sleeping frog song, bird song, and stilled porch swing. I've grown old birthing roses, rearing cucumbers, ripening tomatoes, my long days of haze and sun, parched skin, perfumed with citronella and chlorine lace coconut oil have burned me out. My languid nights of humming air conditioners have tired me, wearied my need to outshine spring, to rival winter lawn angels, pelted with icy baseballs of snow, to relinquish my place to you, autumn. I forever lead for you to follow, Unclasp my hand, take your rightful place as I sleep the sleep of dream-filled seasons to wake on the longest day, my day to take my place, my day to shine my glory until we clasp hands again. Thank oh, you. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And now something from Tony. Yeah, I'll do a little something. Yeah. Um... The second death. When does the second death come? Not the quieting of our riotous minds or the cessation of the beating of our hearts. The second death. We cannot agree when life begins. Is, the is it the first flirtatious glance or the first cry or some moment in between? We cannot agree when the soul ends or if it exists. Does it vanish with our last breath or float to heaven on angels' wings guided by an everlasting light? Does it reappear in that squirrel or that king or that slug? When does the second death come? That day, that minute, that instant, when all memory of a life is gone, when knowledge of an existence vanishes. 
when the last person that ever reads the novel, recites the poem, watches the movie, listens to the song, when the last student ever studies the lauded deed or the despicable act, when we no longer are dad or grandma or great uncle, but an unknown ancestor too far down the trunk of the family tree to be seen or named by the leaves on top. How many times have the words been intoned with bedrock certainty that what has been done here, this heroic act, this unparalleled achievement that will be remembered forever, this name to be revered by generations only to have the pages dissolve, the monuments crumble, the inscriptions weather and fade to abyss. We mark the corporal end with familiar ceremony, words of praise and loss, prayers and condolences, tears and heartache, and the rending of garments. Who grieves the second death, the footprint finally erased, the sand forever smooth by the tide? All right, well, thank you everybody for coming out. Once again, thank you so much to Holly uh, and to Emily Sue for two wonderful, uh, wonderful reads. Uh, tonight for two two great features and thank you to all who did uh, the uh, the open mic uh holly has once again put uh, her um her uh links in the uh, in the chat and that will be well thank you everybody here uh and that will be uh, available uh, as well uh, on youtube uh you'll be able to to follow that because we, we do put the comments in there as well so once again i thank you everybody i don't believe that we will see you Trying to think of when the next one is. Will we see you before? Uh, let me get my calendar here. So, uh, yes, we will see you the night before Election Day. So, those of you who can vote early, please vote early. Those of you who, <laughs> who can, those of you who can vote often, please vote often. <laughs> and uh, and, and those... we will see. And we will have everybody have a happy Halloween as well. And so again, thank you, everybody. Wonderful evening. Thank, thank you, you very Tony. Much. Thank you, Tony. Wonderful. Thank you all.